How did I let this happen? Just got a call from the hospital. They said you went AWOL. I need to get back to work. The doctor said you still have 14 broken bones. Which means I have 192 non-broken ones. Thanks for taking care of me, by the way. Marvel's Spider-Man is a game that holds a special place in my heart. I'm an avid Spider-Man fan, and I've been collecting comics since I was a kid. He's my favorite character in all of media. Back in 2018, before Marvel's Spider-Man launched, I was feeling down on the franchise. The comics and the recent movies just weren't doing it for me. I just didn't feel like they understood the character, at least in a way that resonated with me. I'd gotten a bit jaded, you could say. So, I waited for Marvel's Spider-Man with bated breath, hoping that it would be good but fearing that it would let me down. When I booted up the game, however, I was met by the opposite of disappointment. From the opening cutscene, my fears were put to rest. I could tell that Insomniac, the developers of the game, just understood the character at a fundamental level. Peter Parker felt right, or maybe whole is a better word, for the first time in a while. I was amazed from the beginning cutscene and even more blown away once the credits rolled by. The game was more than just an enjoyable experience for me. It gave me hope that the Spider-Man franchise could produce standout stories that felt true to the character. The story I had been waiting years for finally had landed in my lap. That's why I titled this video Restoring My Hope in My Hero. Although Spider-Man media has always done well commercially and critically, for me at least, it gave me the hope and excitement for the future that I had been lacking for a while. So five years later, I wanted to look back on Marvel's Spider-Man and take a trip through this story once more. This time, I was treated to the same amazement I felt during my first playthrough, and somehow an even greater appreciation for the game. Marvel's Spider-Man isn't perfect, however. There are some areas where I think the game misses, I'm going to be a bit tough on the game in some areas, but just know that it comes from a place of true love. What you hear in my voice, it's love. Nothing but love! This video is going to focus primarily on two things, story and how well the game reflects Spider-Man as a character. So when I look at things like gameplay and side content for instance, it will largely be from the perspective of how well they reflect the character and let you step into his shoes. This entire video can be considered a spoiler, so if you haven't played the game or don't want anything revealed, skip this video and come back to it later. With that, true believers, let's kick it off. I'm going to spend a bit of time on the intro cutscene. As I mentioned in my own intro, I think the first cutscene was done so well in Spider-Man that I knew the game was in good hands. The cutscene starts with a panning shot in Peter Parker's apartment, sweeping over his belongings. There's such detail and care put into this shot. There is a deliberate order to the items, which creates a narrative progression. We start with the photos of Peter's family, friends, and New York City. These are the core of Peter Parker. They're the building blocks, the formative pieces which have built him into the man he is. Next comes research and science. Molecular building blocks are on the shelf, followed by research drawings, devices, and prototypes. This shows Peter's love for science, his inventiveness, and his ingenuity. It's something he's carried with him from a very young age, and this is another formative piece. Next comes saving jars for a vacation and a new laptop. This shows that Peter is not a man with great means, and although he aspires to improve this area of life, it's never been a priority, evidenced by the emptiness of the jars. Everything else in his life comes first. His Spider-Man mask follows. A cracked, damaged laptop comes next, showing why Peter needed that saving jar in the first place. After the Spider-Man mask, things become considerably more messy. There's a bulletin board with Daily Bugle headlines messily pinned to it. It shows all the criminals and chaos that have filled Peter's life since he put on the mask. These are immediately followed by a litany of post-it notes. Primarily, they are reminders to handle the basics of Peter's life. Laundry, rent, that sort of thing. As evidenced by the sheer number of post-it notes, it's clear that Peter is unable to keep up with his everyday responsibilities. The proximity of the bugle headlines which outline his Spider-Man heroics illustrates a natural cause and effect. Because of his time as Spider-Man, Peter has had to make sacrifices in his personal life. 
So bringing it all together, the arrangement of these personal items creates a very clear narrative progression. Outlining Peter's childhood to now, we go from the foundations of Peter, to his interests, to his life as Spider-Man, creating a very clear split of Peter Parker versus Spider-Man that he has trouble reconciling. This is masterful storytelling. The sheer love and attention to detail from the outset is how I knew the character was in good hands. Peter Parker is woken up by his phone, a police broadcast at this tower. He has to suit up and get to work. He races to get a Spider-Man suit on as a rent notice slips under his door. We see the same dichotomy as the post-its demonstrated here. Peter is falling behind in his personal life because of Spider-Man. He ignores the notice for now and dives out the window. Control is given to the hands of the player. The very first gameplay mechanic we're introduced to is web swinging, one of the most iconic features of Spider-Man. The web swinging is as liberating as can be. You feel the sheer momentum as you drop and send out a web line. Spidey's body catching from the gravity and racing forward. When Spider-Man lets go, he somersaults through the air, matching the momentum with grace. It feels good the moment you start web swinging, and it remains feeling good long past the credits rolling. Spider-Man is racing to Fist Tower. There's finally enough evidence against the Kingpin of crime to arrest him after eight long years. The Kingpin isn't going to make things easy, however. His henchmen fire upon the police in a bid to delay them from reaching Fist Tower. The goons want to buy Kingpin enough time to escape. Spider-Man steps in to help the boys in blue. We're introduced to the game's combat. I'll delve more into detail later, but suffice it to say, combat feels strong, fast, and sufficiently spider-y. Combat is a fluid dance of strikes and dodges, with Spider-Man ducking under and above his enemies. Once the goons are down, the march to Fist Tower continues. Spider-Man meets with his friend on the force, Yuri Watanabe. She gives him the green light to enter Fist Tower and do his Spider-Man thing. Our hero crashes into the building with no shortage of fanfare. He finds himself in the middle of a war. The police are at his side, shooting at Fist's hired men deeper in the building. Civilians, literally caught in the middle, flee as best they can. It's hard to emphasize just how cinematic and exciting this introduction mission is. The reason why is that although this tutorial is our start to Spider-Man's journey, it really acts as a narrative conclusion. Spider-Man has been trying to take down the kingpin of crime for eight years, as have the police. This is the culmination of nearly a decade of work, and you really feel that. The police are fighting for every inch of ground, seeing their opportunity to finally take down their foe. Kingpin's goons, in contrast, fight with the desperation of a last stand. There are swarms of them, as Spider-Man battles his way through the tower. The gameplay matches the narrative progression. As Spider-Man gets closer to his foe, his enemies deploy increasingly strong methods to stop him, from riot shields to assault rifles to rocket launchers. Each of these weapons serves as a gameplay mechanic for Spider-Man to overcome. Spider-Man has to duck under shields using a slide move, and dodge out of rocket fire and gunshots with correct timing. So the introduction of new gameplay mechanics works well as a tutorial, while enhancing the increasing narrative tension. This all culminates in a boss battle with Big Willy himself, where Spider-Man has to utilize the skills he's learned to take him down. Again, it's impressive how exciting this intro mission remains on multiple playthroughs. You're experiencing the narrative climax of a story you didn't firsthand experience, but you get to feel the payoff, and that payoff feels good. The Kingpin gets carted off on his way to the Slammer. Mission accomplished. However, the Kingpin warns Spider-Man that the city will unravel without him around. He kept the city together, and countless criminals will come out of the woodwork to fill his void. Spider-Man brushes the comment off, but as the player, we sense a level of truth to Kingpin's words. This is the instigating incident of this game's story, after all. This conclusion represents a season of change for New York as well as Spider-Man. Throughout the game, we'll get to see how this change plays out. Spider-Man scarcely has time to breathe before his boss calls him, letting him know that he's late for work. Parker, where are you? The committee will be here soon. We need to run an equipment check. I'm almost there. Flux away. Uh, guess I'll just do it myself. No, don't. It's not safe. Ugh. We're seeing Peter struggle to balance his life as Spider-Man and his other responsibilities in real time, as was alluded to by the post-it notes in his room. He races to his other job. When he gets there, we see that his boss is none other than Dr. Otto Octavius. 
Spider-Man fans among you probably know that this is the alter ego of Dr. Octopus, one of Spider-Man's greatest villains. In Marvel's Spider-Man, he isn't a villain though. At least not yet. Otto has started his experiment without Peter, testing out new prosthetic tech that he and Peter have been working on. The experiment doesn't go soundly, blowing up in their faces, right in time for the committee to show up. And they are not very impressed. Is anyone hurt? No, it, it, it was all the, my fault. The energy levels exceeded our expectations. From a certain viewpoint, that's a very positive development. It doesn't smell very positive. Otto tells Peter to take the rest of the day off, as he's pulled into meetings with the committee, none of them fun sounding. Our first encounter with Otto is short, but still we learn a lot about him. We see that he's a kind, patient man. Peter was late to work, Otto's experiment failed, and he was raked under the coals by the committee. Yet he didn't take his anger out on Peter and remained patient with him. That's a level of patience past what many bosses would afford. Yet at the same time, we see his ambition. Peter is concerned that Otto started without him, but Otto brushes it off. It's clear that his research is more important than health or safety concerns. We'll see the ramifications of this later. When Otto is shuttled away by the committee, Peter decides to stick around and try fixing the damaged equipment. I like this because it showcases a handful of things about Peter's character. Even though he's chronically late, he has a strong sense of work ethic, choosing to help when he just as easily could have left and tended to one of his other thousand responsibilities. Likewise, it shows a true passion for Otto's work. We're introduced to some mini games that we'll be engaging with throughout the game's runtime. Once the equipment is fixed, Peter heads out. He meets with his friend on the force, Yuri, the same one from the Kingpin arrest. She tasks him with fixing some broken police scanners throughout the city. This too is another tutorial where we're introduced to the frequency matching minigame, as well as other random city crimes. Although it's another tutorial, the slower part of the game uses its time wisely. Along with teaching gameplay mechanics, this section further characterizes Yuri and Spider-Man's relationship. You can see the trust between them, although it's a trust held at a distance. Yuri is a cop after all, and Spider-Man is anything but by the books. She doesn't know anything about the man behind the mask. Spider-Man, for his part, doesn't reveal his identity to her. He jokes with Yuri frequently. She's a lot more serious, but she plays along sometimes. As you're swinging from destination to destination, you often hear J. Jonah Jameson's talk show, as he's usually ranting about crime in the city as well as Spider-Man. His rants are all pretty hilarious. In the first show you hear, J. Jonah Jameson's running a BOGO deal with his books, which is just funny for me to think about. This is Just a Facts with J. Jonah Jameson, where listeners like you discuss the issues affecting our city with Pulitzer Prize winning two time. Two time. Pulitzer Prize winning former publisher of the Daily Bugle. Hey, plug the book. And... And as always, if you order Mr. Jameson's book, Spider-Man, Threat or Menace, within 24 hours of our broadcast, you'll get an autographed copy at no extra charge. No personalizations, don't ask, not gonna get it. Character above all else is the most crucial ingredient of Spider-Man's story. So these moments with Otto, Yuri, and even JJ are imperative for building the game's foundation. Meanwhile, they're building upon the gameplay foundation. It shows how Marvel's Spider-Man has an intent focus on storytelling, and uses every moment it can to build upon it. Spidey skulks back to the lab to work on repairing his spider suit. Otto comes in unexpectedly and catches him with the suit. Otto jumps to the conclusion that Peter is Spider-Man's tech helper. This is a common trope throughout Spider-Man media. Someone close to discovering Peter's identity, but they draw the conclusion that Peter is his friend instead. I think it's believable enough here. Peter is tech savvy after all, and clearly Spider-Man has gadgets. I could see how someone could disbelieve that their friend or employee is Spider-Man. Otto departs, but gives Peter an idea for a new suit. When Peter emerges from the lab, he's wearing the game's flagship suit. Insomniac Games' interpretation of the old red and blue, adorned with white spider webs instead of black. I like to state just how impressive I think this suit is. It's hard to create an iconic superhero suit, especially for an existing superhero. There's been a reason that Spider-Man, Batman, and Superman have largely stuck to their original suits, despite occasional deviations. Insomniac's suit looks distinct from the classic suit, yet at the same time it fits perfectly with the game. The white spiders match incredibly well with the red and blue. The suit is almost perfect. As a fan though, of course I have a few nitpicks. I think the red has a bit too much of an orangish tint. I also think the gloves are too busy. Other than that though, I think it looks amazing.
You may think these complaints are ridiculous, but I just want to point out that with the upcoming Spider-Man 2, it looks like both were actually addressed. The Spider-Man 2 iteration of the suit is a deeper red, and the gloves have a simpler design. So I just had to point that out. Yuri directs Spider-Man to Fisk hideout, where Fisk's goons are keeping his rackets going. This is an introduction to another activity, enemy bases. Essentially, Spider-Man can go to these various hideouts throughout the city and take on waves of criminals, with a couple optional challenges like webbing five enemies to walls to earn additional tokens. Tokens. Well, tokens for what? I think this is a good time to dive into a bit more detail about the combat and customization systems. One of the things I love most about prior Spider-Man games is that they give you a wide array of options in how to take down your opponents. I won't get too far into it, as maybe that's another video for another day, but suffice it to say you generally have a lot of combos, acrobatic moves, or web moves at your disposal. There may be one optimal way to take down your enemies, but there are a variety of ways you can express yourself as the wall crawler. You have the freedom to make combat as flashy and acrobatic as you can muster. I think this freedom lends to the fantasy of playing as the wall crawler. He has a ton of tools at his disposal, from his agility to speed to strength, to wall crawling and webs. Getting the ability to use these tools as you see fit and make the character feel as your own during gameplay is something I value. Since it's something I find important in Spider-Man games, I was looking for it in Marvel's Spider-Man. I'm happy to report that this game delivers along that front. As I mentioned earlier, Spider-Man has the basics at his disposal. Attacks and dodges, which serve as the foundation that the game is built upon. However, there are a variety of other tools at your disposal, and it's at your discretion on how often you use them. There are a ton of interactable objects in the environment. Throwables like tires, fire extinguishers, and barrels which you can launch at your enemies like missiles. There are also more specific interactable objects like scaffolding, which you can tip over on unsuspecting goons. Spider-Man can grapple with and throw enemies, acting like a webbed wrestler in the ring. He also has a wide variety of gadgets to use. These range from the expected, like web shooters and impact webbing, to spider drones and suspension devices. Which of these tools you use is entirely up to you. There are some gadgets I use all the time, such as the web shooters and impact webs, while others I hardly touch like the spider drone. The webbing and enemies interact very dynamically with the environment. If you web up an enemy enough, and he's near enough a surface, he'll stick to it. What this means is that you can web your enemies to the ground, or high up on the wall if you want. Stealth is an option during many encounters as well, where the gadgets also can aid you. The web shooter can lure enemies to certain locations, or the impact webbing can be used for quick takedowns. With all these tools together, you can play Spider-Man your way. You can play Spider-Man as a close-up brawler, relying on punches, kicks, and throws to take on your foes. You can be a gadget fiend, deploying drones and shocking your enemies with electric webs. Or, you can use my preferred style being a web warrior, where you focus on webbing your enemies to surfaces for quick, clean takedowns. You can enhance your playstyle through this game's customization system. You get experience points and level up, and you're able to select various enhancements, which vary from new combat moves to mobility enhancements. When you level up too, new suits become available for Spider-Man to equip. The suits are a great bit of fan service, and it feeds into playing Spider-Man your way. You can don the suit of Spider-Man for many universes and eras. Although I have my favorites, for this video I'm going to stick with Insomniac's suit. I learned my lesson from my Halo Reach video for my eccentric style decisions. When you unlock a suit, you don't just unlock the cosmetic. Each suit comes with an ability which can activate on cooldown. Battle Focus regenerates your focus meter, the source used for your takedowns and your healing. You can see how this would feed into that brawler playstyle. With Web Blossom, Spider-Man will launch into the air and web his enemies around him. This is my favorite as you might have assumed, and it plays right into my playstyle. It's completely overpowered too. I actually stopped using it during this video because I didn't want half of my gameplay footage to be me clearing an area with Web Blossom. Balance issues aside, there are a litany of other cool abilities which can further enhance your ability to play your way. Suit mods are another cherry on top. You can unlock additional perks, which can even further optimize your gameplay. For instance, one mod boosts the amount your web abilities add to the focus meter. So if you use web abilities frequently, this is a good one to have. All of these abilities, mods, and suits require unlocks. That's where we bring this full circle back to the tokens. Each activity type in the city, from small crimes to city bases, to collectibles like backpacks and landmarks, provide you with a different type of token. 
Once you have enough tokens of the requisite types, you can unlock the ability. Thus, Marvel's Spider-Man encourages you to engage with its side content by powering the unlock system. We'll dive more into the side content later in the video. For now, we'll continue pushing along with the story. Peter visits the Feast Homeless Shelter, where his Aunt May works. When he steps in, it's apparent that Peter visits often, as a lot of people within greet him. The reason he visits the shelter today is to celebrate May's fifth year anniversary of working there. Martin Lee, who owns the shelter, gives her accolades and says she is his inspiration. After the festivities, Peter and Martin Lee talk, mainly about May. Thanks again for setting all this up. Oh, I just wish I could do more. Well, May's always told me if you help someone, you help everyone. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should send May to City Hall to have a word with the mayor. Martin Lee, in a very casual and offhand way, mentions that May should have a talk with the mayor. This comment is something I breezed past on my first few playthroughs. However, this is actually foreshadowing for later in the game. Martin Lee's hatred for the mayor is bubbling here, but it's kept under wraps, unnoticed by players except for when revisiting the game. It's another example of how much care Insomniac puts into every character, injecting them with subtlety that makes them feel more real. As soon as Peter leaves, he's alerted of a break-in by Yuri. Somebody is trying to steal from an auction to sell Wilson Fisk's art. She wants Spider-Man to check it out, quietly if he can. On his way, he gets a call from May. They have a touching moment where they tell each other how important the other has been in their life. Don't apologize. I just wanted to tell you how much what you said meant to me. I always wonder if I'm doing right by you. Well, stop wondering. After losing my parents and Uncle Ben, there are so many times I would have fallen apart if not for you. Well, that works both ways, Peter. This moment is injected as the player is moving between objectives. Insomniac again uses every chance it can get to build upon the characters. And the free time when Spider-Man is traversing through the city serves as the perfect mechanism to deliver it. This strategy will be employed frequently throughout the game. The player is kept engaged by the fun swinging mechanics while they get to listen in on conversations that build up the characters and world. It's one of the best examples of exposition delivery I've seen in games. When Spider-Man gets to the scene, it's apparent that this isn't some run-of-the-mill robbery. The villains wear distinct demon masks, signifying that they're part of some unknown criminal element. They also have a hostage, so Spider-Man has to use stealth in order to take down the enemies. In short order, Spider-Man runs into a very familiar face. Hey, Pete. MJ? What are you doing here? Same as you. Working. At least, I was. Oh, I uh, think this is yours. Yeah, thanks. The conversation between Spider-Man and MJ is very stilted. They've broken up, and it's clear that they're pretty awkward about it, and don't quite know how the other is going to react. Peter asks why MJ is here. She recounts the events, sending us on a flashback 15 minutes prior. This brings together two of the most controversial things about Marvel's Spider-Man. First are these civilian gameplay sections. Throughout the game, you take a break from playing as Spider-Man to play as Mary Jane or later Miles Morales. Neither has superpowers, so you're generally sneaking or walking around instead. The criticism of these sections is pretty straightforward. People think they're very boring and that they kill the pacing of the game. I get this sentiment and I agree with it partially. There are too many of these sections throughout the game. You could cut out a sizable portion and I don't think the game would be worse off. However, I do think playing through the eyes of MJ and Miles is really effective during certain parts of the game from a storytelling perspective, and I think it's worth the drop in gameplay excitement. As we go through each of these moments, I'll point out which are good and which are bad. The second controversial thing about Marvel's Spider-Man is Mary Jane's portrayal. She deviates from the traditional depiction as an actress and model, and is instead a reporter. I'll go through my thoughts on her throughout the game, because I think I have a fairly nuanced take and my opinion changes on her throughout the runtime. What I'd like to point out about this first appearance is that Mary Jane gets a tour of Fisk's art exhibit by lying about her credentials to the museum curator. The real reason she's there is to expose the curators under the board's activities with Fisk. Are you sure there's nothing you'd like to say, maybe off the record, regarding Fisk's activities? When the curator gets flustered, MJ decides to sneak around and see what else she can learn. She sneaks into her room, 
adding trespassing to our list of ethical and legal violations. This list is going to grow at an alarming rate throughout the game. As far as civilian gameplay sections goes, this first one is fine. On the tour, MJ gets to interact with the art pieces, and she reminisces about Peter's bouts with the Kingpin of Crime. I like these small bits of storytelling. Her sneaking around is short and sweet, and this section doesn't overstay its welcome. After solving a statue puzzle, she discovers files about Devil's Breath. This, though, is when things go haywire and the demons show up. We've returned to the present. Peter has to take out the demons so MJ and the curator can escape. It's an easy enough task for the wall crawler. Afterwards, Peter and MJ meet up for dinner. One small detail to notice is Peter's body language. He sits in a very tense way. Clearly, he has a bit of nerves meeting with MJ and speaking to her again. MJ laments Robbie from the bugle raking her over the coals for her antics and her having to meet with the legal team. So it looks like I'll be meeting with the legal team. Again. This shows that her trespassing a lion is an exception for a story about the kingpin. It's a norm for her. She'll break what rules she needs to get the story and seems to have a little care about ethics or the law. As you might be able to tell, this rubs me the wrong way. But I'm not going to fully hop on that train just yet. They move on to talking about their personal life. MJ asks about Peter's day job, and he speaks with genuine joy about his work with Otto. They talk about their relationship and where it stands. Both of them don't really know. The conversation ends by police sirens. Peter has to head out. These moments between Peter and MJ really work for me. She asks about his personal life, and through her tone, you can tell she has a genuine care and interest in how his life is going, even if they aren't together anymore. Their relationship conversation, while uncomfortable, feels very genuine. Two people who care for each other, but who aren't quite sure if it'll work out between them. So as you can tell, there are things I really like about this MJ portrayal. And then there are things, especially coming up, that I really dislike. The yin and yang of Mary Jane, I guess. Let's continue. Spider-Man ends up chasing down the Shocker, a villain from his rogues gallery with shock gauntlets and a knack for robbing banks. One thing I'd like to commend is the mission structure and pacing. Peter Parker's life is a constant juggle between a civilian life and his superhero responsibilities. He's always pogoing around from one event to the next, barely keeping all the plates spinning, so to speak. Marvel's Spider-Man captures that better than any other Spider-Man game. You're constantly darting back and forth in the city, from Dr. Octavius' lab to the Feast Center to crimes in the streets. It shows how even the mission structure and pacing can lend to building character and making you identify as Peter just by how you navigate between important places in his life. You're taking part in his juggling act. Speaking of the Feast Center, Peter returns to it after putting on the shocker. Martin Lee has a degree in art history, so he's the perfect man to ask about the Fisk's art heist and the masks that the demons wear. Lee warns Peter that MJ should back off the story. Peter asks if she's in danger. Do you think she's in trouble? I don't know. The tone in this line is just perfect. Lee is the man behind the demons, which we'll learn later in the story. There's a duality to his nature, an inner fight between his good side and bad. When he says, I don't know here, you still feel like he genuinely means it. He probably hasn't made up his mind if he and his demons need to treat MJ as a threat. It's subtlety delivered through tone and more evidence of the game's commitment to character. Peter returns to Otto's lab, where he's testing his prosthetic technology on a volunteer. The experiment is going pretty well, but that doesn't help when Norman Osborn shows up on the scene. Norman Osborn, a familiar name to even the most casual of Spider-Man fans. This is the Green Goblin, Spider-Man's arch nemesis. However, in Marvel's Spider-Man, he isn't the Green Goblin, at least not yet. Not in this story. Instead, he is the mayor of New York City, and he has come to confiscate Otto's equipment for violating safety protocols. This is a fantastic introduction to Norman. It establishes his personality and his relationships with Peter and Otto seamlessly. He's a nice, amicable man on the surface, but you can see a calculating cold man hiding just underneath. He's capable of switching from kind to ruthless with the drop of a hat. Peter knows him personally from his relationship with Norman's son, Harry. He respects Peter's intellect and implies that he would support Peter in future ventures. Otto and Norman have a shared animosity and clearly know each other well. There's a ton of subtext to the dialogue, which makes it engaging and interesting. Norman departs, leaving Otto to pick up the pieces. Next, Peter helps with some of Harry's old research labs in the city. It's an introduction to a new side activity, so I'll dive more into it later. 
On the way, we get one of my favorite JJ monologues in the game. And now for listener emails. Bay from Queens writes, You're so full of anger and I wish you'd get help managing it. It's terrible for your health. Now I know she speaks from a place of concern, but this is a common misconception that I have to correct. I'm not full of anger. I'm full of love. I call out injustice, corruption, and crimes against humanity because I adore this city, and I want it to be better. What you hear in my voice, it's love. Nothing but love. Bad news follows. The shocker has been let out of prison by a guard who seems to have glowing eyes. A disturbing development, but Spider-Man has to deal with the task at hand. Shocker. This is one of my favorite boss fights in the game. It's simple, but it's cinematic. Dodging the Shocker's blast while Dupree comes tumbling down is a fun spectacle. The Bank Vault Arena looks great, and it's the most befitting setting for the Shocker's character. During the fight, Spider-Man learns that the Shocker's performing this heist under duress. The people who freed him, well, they want him to rob this bank too. As I banged on about, Insomniac is great at using every gameplay situation to further progress the story, and that includes boss fights. Spider-Man puts the Shocker away, but there's clearly more to this story under the surface. There's been a good narrative buildup of the demons, and their underhanded nature points to more insidious goals than just art robberies. Spider-Man gets tipped off to a warehouse where the demons have been seen. He takes out the demons on the property, and a police car arrives on the scene. Out steps Officer Jefferson Davis. You know we can't have vigilantes trespassing or doing illegal searches. Yeah, I know. Which is why I brought a warrant. So what do you say we do some perfectly legal searching? I like the sound of that. What's your name? Officer Davis. Call me Jeff. And you are? Uh... <laughs> Just messing with you. My son's a big fan. So, that warrant cover breaking down doors? Not without a lot of extra paperwork. So Spider-Man and Officer Davis search the warehouse together. Through the process they chat, and we get to know Davis better. He's an incredibly likable guy. Sometimes it's hard to articulate exactly why a character's likable, but Officer Davis fits the bill. I guess it just comes down to that he's down to earth and genuine. He's a normal guy somehow searching a warehouse with the guy who climbs walls, and he deals with that bizarreness with a simple wry humor. His likableness is important, as our easy fondness for him makes later parts of the game more impactful. He and Spider-Man come across a secret armory where the demons have cleared out. They find the demons stuffing the weapons into vehicles, so they give chase. The chase goes awry, and Spider-Man has to stop a train from crashing into a truck. This leaves him exposed to a demon. Officer Davis comes to the rescue, crashing a squad car into the demon, risking his own life to protect Spider-Man. Spidey is able to pull up the semi-truck, avoiding calamity. Paramedics arrive, as does the press. That includes Mary Jane, our favorite Bugle reporter. She sneaks past the police line to interview Davis. The other reporters are mad at this, and while I don't blame them, they're playing by the rules. MJ isn't. Laws seem more like a suggestion to her. When Peter gets home, he discovers some unwelcome news, and that news is that he doesn't have a home anymore. He's been evicted, and all his belongings thrown in the trash. Evidently, his landlord had had enough of Peter being late. Peter has to chase down his belongings by tracking down dumpster trucks. It's a funny and sad section of the game, and it's one of my favorites because it captures the core part of Spider-Man. Peter's life is a constant juggle, an impossible one. He has to let some of his plates drop, and in this case, that plate is rent. In other words, Peter's responsibility as Spider-Man requires sacrifice. The life he lives invites hardship and difficulties that spill over into his personal life. Yet Peter doesn't give in to despair. He immediately moves into action, tracking down trucks like a dumpster detective. That suffering for doing the right thing, yet that perseverance through it all, is quintessentially the character. Peter needs to figure out a place to stay for the night. He considers asking MJ, but he decides that would be too awkward. Aunt May called. Peter had plans to get dinner with her, but he missed it. Another plate he had been balancing crashed to the ground. Instead of being angry, though, Aunt May hears that he's been evicted and without hesitation, she offers him to crash on her office couch. He accepts. When he wakes up, he sees that May also left him an envelope with some cash to get him back on his feet. 
Aunt May refuses to hear his protests about not accepting the money. This too just perfectly captures the dynamic between them. Peter's too prideful to go to Aunt May for help. She shows her love for him in such a steady, genuine way. She helps him just as much as he needs but not more, knowing how he'll act. This scene shows why she is such an integral part of his life and his foundation as a man. Martin Lee shows up and lets May know that he'll be heading out of town and she'll be in charge. He's pretty vague about it all and there's a reluctance to him. He puts his hand on the doorframe in a very longing way. We get the sense that this goodbye is a lot more final than Lee is letting on. MJ's article on Officer Davis really took off. Now he'll be given the key to the city by Mayor Norman Osborne. She offers for Peter to go to the ceremony with her as she covers it, and he accepts. Officer Davis calls Spider-Man. He's received word that the demons are moving on a Fisk construction tower. He can't go himself with the upcoming ceremony, so he asks Spider-Man to check it out. It's another good sign of his character. Even with the ceremony in his honor coming up, he's still thinking about others. This isn't overstated or overplayed, though. Again, it's a genuineness which goes far in making him likable. Spider-Man arrives at the site, and he has to save Fist's men from the demon attack. Things go haywire pretty quickly, and Spider-Man has to chase a helicopter through the city as it swings a makeshift wrecking ball around. He manages to stop the demons and web up the helicopter. A civilian on the street watches in awe, particularly Miles Morales. He's the son of Jefferson Davis, and he's late to the ceremony. He heads there in a rush, as does Peter. Officer Davis is a bit nervous about the speech, but he doesn't let it stop him. He describes himself as just a guy who doesn't give up. Peter and MJ watch from the crowd. It turns out that the award ceremony doubles as a campaign rally for Osborne. It reinforces his nice on the outside, calculating on the inside personality. Even though Peter stopped the demons, he still feels like something is wrong, but he can't place it. When MJ suggests coffee to discuss it, Peter ups the ante and asks MJ to dinner. Osborne gets interrupted during the ceremony for a phone call. Somebody threatens him. Listen, jackass, I get threats like this twice a week. Why don't you grow a pair and tell me what you want? He doesn't take it seriously at first, but then he decides it's better to leave. Chaos erupts when the demons strike. There's a suicide bomber right on stage. Jefferson pushes him away and tries to save other officers. Confusion follows. Miles and Peter are both knocked unconscious. Miles revives first, and he decides to find his dad, ignoring his mom's protests. He sneaks his way back to the stage, avoiding the demons who are slaughtering civilians without remorse. So this is another section where you play as a civilian rather than Spider-Man. However, this is a case where Miles' perspective is really effective from a storytelling front, and the game is better off for it. Seeing this massacre from Miles' point of view really communicates just how horrifying and dangerous this situation is. He's powerless to stop any of the demons. All he can do is sneak past and watch. This scene just wouldn't have had the same potency if you played as Spider-Man or just viewed it through a cutscene. Miles reaches his dad, but he's too late. Miles is at the mercy of the demons, but someone stops the killings. As Martin Lee, philanthropist turned terrorist and killer, he and his goons flee the scene. Jefferson Davis's funeral follows. Peter tries to comfort Miles, but he just doesn't know what to say. This was a disaster. The one silver lining, albeit a microscopically thin one, is that Peter saw Martin Lee. He knows who's behind the demons. The problem is he has no evidence. Yuri refuses to move into action. Peter has to find a way to track down Lee and prove his guilt. I've loved Spider-Man ever since I can remember, and reading Spider-Man comics was my biggest inspiration for becoming a writer myself. Along with doing YouTube, I have a science fiction series called The Northfield Saga. It's set in a post-apocalyptic world, one decade after the dropping of gas bombs left the world as a husk. My novels follow the story of Mark Northfield, a man doing his best to be moral in a world of decay. The third novel in the series, Stormrise, just came out this last month. It would mean the world to me if you checked out my series and gave my books a shot. I have a dream of them hitting the bestseller list one day, and i love for you all to be a part of that story. Thanks for all the support. I truly appreciate each and every one of you for watching this video. MJ gives Spidey a lead on Martin Lee. She did some digging and discovered that he bought a controlling interest in a recycling company. It would be worthwhile for him to check out the warehouse and see if he can find any information on what Lee's planning. 
This is an example where MJ's job as a reporter works well for the game. It allows MJ to be an active contributor in Spider-Man's journey and give her and Peter things to talk about aside from their relationship. Spidey checks out the warehouse and knocks together some demon heads along the way. He discovers a map of targets, Norman Osborn campaign offices along with the bombs that do it. The demons don't care about the gang war in the city. They're not looking to take over Wilson Fisk's empire. Norman Osborn has been the primary target the whole time. Spider-Man also finds a lead to the demon's staging area for the attack. On the way, he calls Yuri and lets her know about the attack so she can start evacuating Norman's offices. He takes out the demons in the staging area and he finds another lead. Pale Horse Rides in Auto Shop. There's an oddly expensive invoice there. Before he can ruminate further, more demons show up. They aren't alone, however. Goons show up in white and begin trying to exterminate the demons. Silver Sable shows up. She's an international mercenary running Sable International and these are her soldiers. She's been hired by Norman Osborn for additional protection in the city. She doesn't like Spider-Man much and he sure doesn't like her. Yuri gets between them. She doesn't like the arrangement either, but she has to work with it. She tracks down the bomb site, but there isn't evidence there that leads directly back to Lee. Spider-Man needs to find more proof. What better place to check for it than Feast? It's Martin Lee's shelter and Peter visits all the time anyway. He goes to Feast and he has a chat with Aunt May. Peter brings up Miles and that volunteering in the shelter might do him some good. Keep him busy and all that. After all, Peter and Miles have a lot in common and staying busy helped Peter with his own family losses. I really like this moment because it gives us insight into how Peter thinks. Even though he's on a mission to stop Lee, he's still thinking about the people in his personal life. It shows both his sincere care, but also shows a constant juggling in his own mind. Peter uncovers a secret room attached to Lee's office, and he finds a file on Devil's Breath. The folder will help him figure out what Lee's planning next. He triggers a trap in the room, an electrified floor, which will kill anyone without the ability to stick on the ceiling. He slips out of the room and runs right into Martin Lee. Their encounter is tense. Lee suspects Peter has been digging around. He gives an underhanded warning that Peter should stay away. I don't think you or May have anything to worry about, as long as you stay away from places you're not supposed to be. When Lee leaves, Peter follows him out. Lee uses his powers on the surrounding homeless people, drying out their negative side and bending them to his will. They attack Peter as Lee drives away. This is an important note on Lee's character. In his pursuit of Osborne, if he's willing to hurt Peter, a former friend, it's clear that he'll hurt anyone. Peter passes the evidence he found to Yuri. She finally has enough to pursue Lee as a suspect. Next, Peter heads to Otto's lab. They continue work on the prosthetic prototype, but things don't go well. You can see Otto's slow unraveling. He's growing increasingly angry at the project. Peter asks about Otto and Norman's relationship. He's surprised to learn that Otto and Norman started Oscorp together, the massive corporation that is responsible for Osborne's great wealth. Otto left for ethical concerns and was clearly left in the dust on the monetary front. It's not hard to see why Otto doesn't like Norman very much. Peter helps get the prosthetic arm working. Although Otto can't pay Peter due to his reduced funds, Peter still wants to help on the project. This is another example of Peter's true care for the project and a desire to help the world pass his Spider-Man exploits. There's a lot of foreshadowing in this segment. Otto clutches his arm bizarrely during the experiment. Something that seems is up with his health. If Peter looks around, he also sees that Otto is working on a contract with the Raft to improve their security. The Raft is the superhuman prison located on an island. This will become relevant later in the game. What's nice about this foreshadowing is that it's there for players to find, but it's not blunt and in your face. With his work finished, Peter heads to dinner with MJ. While he had a busy day, MJ had an arguably even more exciting one. She checked out the Pale Horse Rides auto shop, the one they found in the Demon's Invoice. She snuck inside and discovers that it's owned by Tombstone, a supervillain from Spider-Man's rogues gallery. Not a good sign. This kicks off an available chain of side quests, which I'll talk about later in the video. She discovers that Tombstone's gang is building an array of armored trucks for Lee. Paired with the bombs they discovered, this isn't a comforting find. Peter isn't super jazzed about her skulking around, but he knows she'll do it again, so he passes her some noisemakers to use. Peter for once is cooking a good dinner. He's notoriously bad at cooking in the comics, so it's nice to see that small quirk carry over into the game. They reminisce on their time together, which leads them to talking about their relationship. 
I want to praise this dialogue by how naturally it transitions from spider talk to their relationship. These feel like genuine turns in the conversation. As a writer, I know how difficult it can be to steer dialogue in directions in natural ways, so I just wanted to point that out in praise. The organicness of Peter and MJ's dialogue really helps you buy into their relationship. Peter makes the blunder of asking MJ if she wants to be a sidekick. Pro tip, fellas, calling your would-be girlfriend your sidekick probably isn't going to go over well. MJ says she wants to be partners. There's a lot of subtext here. You can detect that this is the reason for their breakup. MJ felt second fiddle to Peter and didn't feel like she was needed in his life. This is a very natural sort of argument for Peter and MJ to have in the comics, so I think it's great in principle. I think the execution is where things go a bit awry, which I'll delve more into as things progress. Peter has to leave, as he got an alert about Oscorp's CFO being in danger. He always seems to be leaving MJ. It's easy to see how this could put a strain in their relationship. Peter saves the CFO, Charles Standish, and asks him about Devil's Breath. The CFO has heard of it, but he has no clue what it actually is. Norman's holding Devil's Breath so close to his chest that even the CFO doesn't know much about it. The intrigue builds. Peter gets a name from Standish, though. A doctor named Isaac Delaney. Spidey tracks down the lead. Along the way, he gets a call from Otto. Basic prosthetics aren't quite ambitious enough for the good doctor anymore. People who've lost an arm understandably want it back, but we can give them something better. The human body doesn't need to be our default. We can go so far beyond it. Just some thoughts to conjure with. Doc's really giving it both barrels. If he doesn't burn himself out. Instead of restoring human functionality, he can improve it. We as the audience read that Otto's starting to become a bit unhinged, but Peter doesn't recognize it. This highlights one of Peter's flaws. He sees the best in people, but unfortunately, that can leave him unable to fully see their dark sides. This is a pattern we saw with Martin Lee until it's too late, and we're starting to see it with Otto. It's not overstated, and it lends to making Peter feel three-dimensional and complex. Peter tracks on Dr. Delaney to a Halloween party at Empire State University. He knows Dr. Delaney is dressed up as one of his supervillains, and he has to find him amidst the crowd. I love this mission because it provides some good levity to the game. Seeing the lizard busting moves on the dance floor is just a hilarious sight. Things become decidedly unfriendly when demons grab Delaney and usher him off the stage. Peter follows Delaney into ESU's labs. There he sees Martin Lee's powers firsthand. He corrupts Dr. Delaney into giving him the name he wants, Morgan Michaels, and he absorbs powers from his underlings to take down Spider-Man. Spider-Man watches, helpless, as Dr. Delaney turns a gun on his own head and pulls the trigger. It's one of the darkest moments of the game. Because this is following straight off the comic relief Halloween party, the darkness of the scene contrasts strongly and makes it even more potent. It's a good use of contrast to enhance the story moment. Peter fights demons and returns to ESU grounds. The Halloween party is chaotic, with Lee having corrupted many of the students and faculty. Spider-Man has to subdue the corrupted civilians. There's a nice attention to detail in his animations. When an enemy reaches low enough health, Spider-Man will toss them to the ground and web them up, a relatively more gentle move than pounding them over the head into ground meat. MJ digs up another lead. She finds a connection between Wilson Fisk and Norman Osborn in the Devil's Breath file. Osborn came to Fisk to build a secret lab hidden from regulators, So Spider-Man heads to Oscorp to investigate. There's a fun infiltration segment where you have to stealth on the walls while Sable's guards try to find you. He sneaks in and overhears Osborne talking to Fisk over the phone. He reaches Fisk's computer and comes across GR-27, the laboratory named for Devil's Breath. It turns out that GR-27 is not actually a bioweapon. It's meant to be a cure for genetic diseases, but the kinks haven't quite been worked out yet. As it stands, GR-27 is an incredibly contagious hazard that kills people. It's bad enough that the lab techs nicknamed it Devil's Breath. Against all regulations, Osborne is continuing the experiment. If the truth comes out, it could spell the end of not only his political ambitions, but Oscorp itself. The question is, why is he risking so much for this project? That question can wait. Peter finds a connection with Morgan Michaels. He's the lead scientist, and he holds the only sample on his person at all times. It's evident why Lee is hunting him. Spider-Man needs to reach him first. MJ is convinced that Standish is the most likely person to know of Michael's whereabouts. The problem is he's being kept at a Sable International facility in Central Park under heavy guard. MJ takes it upon herself to infiltrate the outpost and get info from Standish. This section of the game is where I have the biggest gripes, so I'm about to enter rant mode. Prepare yourselves. 
Earlier, I mentioned how some of the civilian sections in this game work, while others don't work. This is an example where an MJ section just doesn't work. Sable International is this elite military organization, and there are tons and tons of soldiers in this outpost. The thought of a regular reporter like MJ being able to infiltrate her way in like a super spy is too much for my suspension of disbelief to handle. It just feels ridiculous. I know some people are going to scoff and say this is a superhero game, where far more unbelievable things happen. I think this criticism misunderstands how suspension of disbelief works though. The closer something is to the real world, the closer it has to be to reality to be believable. Things that are far removed from our daily life, like superpowers, are easier for us to buy into because we're not familiar with them. If a mega mech breaks the laws of physics, we're probably not going to bat an eye, because mechs are far removed from our reality and we're not really familiar with them. But if you're watching a movie and you see someone make toast by boiling it in a pot instead of popping the bread into the toaster, you're going to raise an eyebrow. You know how making toast works, so something so wrong sticks out to you. This is a bit oversimplified of how suspension of disbelief works, and there are exceptions, but I hope my analogy still gets through. We get how weird it would be for a reporter without other qualifications sneaking past such a well-guarded post. But even if you ignore the suspension of disbelief, this still undercuts the threat of Sable International. This game builds up Sable International as an elite spec ops unit, and they even take down Spider-Man multiple times. They can take down Spider-Man, but they can't stop a normal reporter from just waltzing into their base? It's sending mixed messages on how big of a threat they are. But whatever, chalk this up to a particular bone I'm picking. That part isn't a huge deal. My real issues start when MJ reaches Standish and he points a gun at her. She manages to soften him up, but he's still pointing a gun directly at MJ's chest when Spider-Man arrives. He jumps in to save her, and Standish trips and hits his head. This is the one part of the game that really aggravates me. MJ's reaction is just unreasonable. Peter saw a loved one at gunpoint and he jumped in to save her. That's a completely justified and even heroic action. Instead of being grateful for the save, MJ is furious at him. But with what Peter knew from the outside, what on earth was he supposed to do? If someone was pointing a gun at your girlfriend and you could stop it, would you really wait around and leave things up to chance? Peter didn't even hit the guy. Standish tripped. She's mad they left early, but Sable guys were coming in. Again, shouldn't it be good that her safety is Peter's number one priority? MJ rails into Peter multiple times for this. She accuses Peter of wanting her chained to her laptop, which just feels absurd. Actually, scratch that. He'd probably just tell me to go home and chain myself to my laptop. Let's take this at face value. Peter doesn't want his girlfriend, a normal reporter, to legally break into dangerous international military outposts. And when he jumps in to save her, this somehow all means that he wants her chained to her laptop? Like that's so beyond the pale it kind of escapes words. I think the most frustrating part is that the game treats MJ as if she's in the right here. Peter thinks he's screwed up and did wrong, even though he's acting like a reasonable person. This is the prime example of why so many people have an issue with MJ's portrayal in this game. I think people falsely attribute it to MJ being a reporter instead of a model. That's not the issue at all. Marvel's Spider-Man isn't the first to interpret MJ as a reporter. The Ultimate Spider-Man series had MJ going down a similar career path, and it was heavily implied that she would become a reporter after high school. Nobody I know of was mad then. Plus, I think her being a reporter was the right choice for the game. It gives her more ways to interact with Peter's life as Spider-Man, and in a game, you'll be spending more time as Spider-Man than you might otherwise see in a movie, comic, or show. So the issue isn't the idea, but the execution. As I've pointed out, MJ and her reporter role can come across as very selfish and unethical. She seems like she cares nothing about the law, ethics, safety, or code of conduct. Well, you could scoff and say that's hypocritical because Spider-Man is breaking laws, there are a few differences. The first is that Peter has superpowers. It should be clear why him facing danger is a bit less of a concern than MJ. And when Peter breaks the law, it's usually because he has to and it's for a noble goal. You rarely see Peter have any personal benefit when he bends the rules. While you could argue MJ is after the same noble goal, her role as a reporter means that there's always a personal benefit. She's going to get that article posted with her name in the byline and all the accolades and promotions that come with it. Her job makes it about personal ambition, and so any of that nobility seems to melt away. It often feels like the game has an attitude that she's in the right, even when it seems like us as the audience, she's acting unreasonable. It just doesn't work. Now, I want to clear the air. Even though I just vomited out a lot of negative thoughts, I don't hate this MJ. Her relationship with Peter, when it avoids conversations about her job, is genuinely heartwarming, and it's easy to root for them as a couple. After this low point, MJ's character gets considerably better throughout the rest of the game. 
and it's redeemed enough for me to remain invested in her character and want the best for her and Peter. Still, her character is something I think could be improved on, and is something I hope is handled a bit better in the sequel. Miles' mom, Rio, calls Peter and thanks him for getting Miles the job at Feast. Again, I want to point out how I love how much of the story is delivered while you're exploring the open world. The constant building of story and characters really pays dividends by the game's close. Peter returns to Otto's lab. His progression in the neural interface is going well, but Peter catches that something is wrong. Otto reveals that he has a neurodegenerative disorder and that he'll lose bodily function within the year. Now's a good time to talk about how this is my favorite interpretation of Otto Octavius outside of the Raimi movies and the Ultimate Spider-Man comics. Everything about him comes together so nicely. With the reveal of his illness, you suddenly understand why Otto's been getting so frustrated at every hitch in the process. His life is a ticking clock, and any delays are costly. Furthermore, you see why he's so willing to disregard safety precautions, even though he seems otherwise like a commendable scientist. His bitterness at his past with Norman, plus his illness, are creating the perfect time bomb for something disastrous to happen. On Peter's way to feast to meet Miles for his first day, he finds Miles being mugged by some thugs. After taking out the goons, he takes the time to teach Miles how to fight. This moment showcases why Spider-Man is such a special hero. He doesn't just save people, he cares enough that, even given his busy schedule, he's willing to spend time with someone to help them pass just their safety. When Peter leaves, Miles has to get to feast. There are sable perimeters set up, so he has to sneak past. This is another civilian section that I think could be cut from the game. It doesn't really add much, and it serves as another way Sable International is undercut as a threat. This elite military's checkpoints can be waltzed through by a kid, who can hack into their systems, which further demonstrates their poor security. This segment showcases Miles' intelligence and ingenuity. I think we see that enough elsewhere in the game, though, where this doesn't feel needed. At Feast, Peter shows Miles around. There's a great scene where he helps a man reset the TV, and he's met by a news broadcast about his dad. You see Miles' triumph at fixing the TV quickly be melted away by grief. His facial expressions alone are potent, and you really feel for him. It's an excellent show rather than tell moment, and it demonstrates how Miles' grief will follow him, and always be a part of him in some form. Sable's mercenaries escort Michaels, the scientist with devil's breath. Things quickly go awry as Lee's demons kidnap him and stow him in their truck. Spider-Man has to chase after the truck, fighting goons on top of it as Sable commands him to leave. The gameplay in this segment is awesome, as you have to fight on top of a moving truck with demons swarming. It's fast, frenetic, and urgent, matching the story's tone perfectly. Lee manages to get his hands on Spider-Man and uses his powers on him. Spider-Man's consciousness enters a dark realm where he has to fight off Lee's influence. The visuals are cool, and there's this fishbowl quality to the camera that makes it all feel disorienting. He fights off the influence but has to stop the truck from hitting civilians. He manages to do so, but at the cost of the truck crashing and Devil's Breath being stolen. Sable is not happy about it. She flattens Spider-Man. Last I checked, Silver Sable doesn't have superpowers, so her ability to beat Spider-Man here is a bit strange. It comes across as a bit contrived, having her beat him to make her and Sable International feel more imposing. Normally I wouldn't comment on something like this, but I think it goes to my point about Sable International feeling inconsistent. Sometimes, the game makes a big deal about how elite they are, while other times making them feel like chumps. Spider-Man and his allies have an imminent disaster on their hands. Lee has Devil's Breath. They need to stop him from using it. Meanwhile, MJ checks out Oscorp's tech conference at the Grand Central Station, because Standish said the demons were looking for something there. While she ended up being more on the mark than she knew, Lee and his demons show up. He takes hostages, MJ among them. Lee inserts Devil's Breath into a dispersal device, and he demands that Norman Osborn show up. One of the hostages gets a bit rowdy, and a demon moves to kill him. MJ steps in and saves his life. Since she's a reporter, she can contact Osborn easier and make sure he gets there on time. This is a great MJ moment. She's quick thinking under pressure, and she uses her reporting powers for good rather than evil. It contrasts greatly with what we've seen before with MJ and her job. As I said, it's up and up for MJ from here on. She really wins me back over. Spider-Man shows up, and his first priority is getting MJ out. She refuses, stating that people could die and she wants to help. She got herself into this mess, and she can get herself out. See, in a way, this is a repeat of their earlier conflict. However, the details and execution are everything. Both her and Peter have totally reasonable points of view. 
His first priority is saving his loved ones, then everyone else. MJ isn't focused on her own safety, but everyone else's. A stealth segment follows where you play as MJ. However, she isn't defenseless this time. She can order Spider-Man to take down guards. This is another time where a civilian moment really works. It's cool to see MJ and Peter working as a team and see Spider-Man in action from a civilian's perspective. MJ manages to defuse the bomb, leaving Peter free to pursue Martin Lee. They brawled out in a subway train, and Spider-Man manages to come out on top. He and MJ text after the ordeal, and there's classic miscommunication. Peter says it's over, and he's referring to Lee's arrest. But MJ thinks he's talking about their relationship. This type of miscommunication is something we've all done before, and it helps make the relationship feel more real. Peter heads to Otto's lab to discover that the doctor has taken his work on the neural interface and run with it. He's passed right by prosthetics and moved to Ock Arms. As the audience we wince at the sight, we see what Otto's becoming. Otto's very cheery, but he seems a bit emotionally unbalanced. Something isn't right. Peter checks out the neural interface. Let's see if that worked. No, this is worse than I thought. This is a moment where puzzles are used to great storytelling effect. We see diagnostic test after diagnostic test fail. As soon as Peter fixes one issue, another critical issue pops up on the screen. It's very tense as you feel the situation deteriorating out of control. Peter manages to stabilize the interface, but he begs Otto to take it out of his neck. It needs more testing to put it lightly. Otto lashes out, another sign that his emotional state is deteriorating. Still, he sees reason and he relents. He deactivates the neural interface. When Peter leaves though, Otto sees Norman on the TV. His rage engulfs him, and he puts the interface back in. This is the pivotal moment, the point of transformation. Otto has chosen his path, revenge on Norman at any cost. Peter talks with Aunt May about Mary Jane. May asks if Peter's honest with her. He doesn't get the chance to answer. On TV, he sees that a sable vehicle's been broken into. He fears the worst, that devil's breath has been stolen. He arrives at the scene and his fears are confirmed. Somehow, there's even worse news. Rikers, the prison holding the city's worst, has just been attacked. He boards a helicopter with Yuri and they head to the island. Luckily, the raft, which contains the superpowered goons, hasn't been breached. Spidey does his best to put out the flames. This level is frenetic and it's excellent at conveying a sense of building dread as the situation continues to deteriorate. Electro appears blasting Yuri's helicopter out of the sky. Spider-Man saves her, but at the cost of Electro breaching the raft. Electro tears through the complex, freeing the superpowered prisoners. One by one, we see Spider-Man's deadliest villains broken out of their chambers. The situation is slipping out of Spider-Man's hands, and there's an increasing danger to his own safety. You feel that primal urge to escape this place, before Spider-Man gets too overwhelmed to fight back. Eventually, he does get too overwhelmed. His enemies gang up on him. He's pummeled and electrified into the dirt. Things can't get any worse. And yet, somehow they do. A hand reaches up from the chasm. A familiar metal arm. Peter's old friend, mentor, and colleague, Dr. Otto Octavius, the last member of this Sinister Six. This reveal is masterful. The game has been building this moment for a while. We've seen the bubbling hatred of Norman, the deteriorating physical and mental state of Otto. We've also seen the raft plans in Otto's lab. He is the only one who had the smarts, means, and motives to pull off this attack. Spider-Man is spared. Otto lets him off with a warning, tossing his battered body to the water below. Otto has devil's breath, and he wastes no time in using it. His target is one of the most trafficked areas of all, Times Square. Despite Spider-Man's best efforts, he's failed. The infection spreads and the city falls into chaos. Aunt May, who gets right to work in helping the sick and wounded, falls ill herself. Osborne and Sable International clamp down on the city, setting up even more checkpoints. They're also on the hunt for Spider-Man, who Norman is shifting the blame on for the illness. This is the narrative low point of the game. Spider-Man has broken bones that are yet to mend, and he's enemy number one in the city. Still, that's not going to stop him. He's going to fix this. This is another great moment of the game, and it encapsulates why Spider-Man is so heroic. He gets knocked down so many times, and he suffers greatly, but he won't stay down. When he heads back out into the city, there's a notable gameplay shift. Sable's men seem to prowl every rooftop, and you can't travel more than a couple of blocks without a sniper laser targeting you. It sells the feeling of being hunted and sells the overall fall of the city into chaos. You used to own the city. Now you're just trying to survive in it. 
Rhino and Electro are causing havoc simultaneously. This is the only time in the game where Spider-Man has multiple main objectives at the same time. There are multiple fires throughout the city, and smoke plumes into the sky. It all lends to the feeling of chaos in the sense that Spider-Man can't be everywhere he needs to at once. Spider-Man heads to each objective. He doesn't stop the villains, but he puts out the fires they've caused. Speaking of fires, Spider-Man feels the effects of not being everywhere he needs to be. Criminals have set fire to the Veteran Center, where Miles, May, and MJ have been helping evacuate people. Spider-Man saves his loved ones from the fire, but then he needs to be saved himself. The fact that Spider-Man botches a simple fire rescue, I think, speaks to the exhaustion and fatigue he's suffering. Afterwards, Peter and MJ share a quiet moment on the rooftop. I love this moment between them, and it's what fully redeemed MJ for me. Peter thanks her for saving him, and she brushes it off, saying he's saved her so many times. She also apologizes for screwing things up, and that it's hard always being the one who gets saved. It's very genuine, loving, and heartfelt. Miles kills the vibe, arriving with some water. He brought some sparkling water though, so he gets a pass from me. No rest for the righteous. Peter heads out to Times Square and he tracks down traces from Devil's Breath. This leads him to one of Otto's secret labs. There is some great storytelling here. By listening to logs, we learn about why the Sinister Six is working with Otto. He's investigated each member and incentivized them with something they want. For the Rhino, it's freedom from his suit. For Vulture, it's a potential cure for the spinal cancer plaguing him a result of the power pack he's worn for his flight suit. For Lee, it's revenge on Osborn, a goal he and Otto share. It demonstrates Otto's shrewdness. He knows how people's minds work and how to bend them to his will. Spider-Man also discovers more about Otto's plans. The Six are targeting Norman's operations. They want to cripple him in every way. Otto detonates a trap. He figured Spider-Man would show up. Our hero escapes, but the danger isn't over yet. The Vulture grabs him and pulls him through the city. This culminates in a boss fight with the Vulture and Electro. This fight is okay. There's a lot of aerial combat, which is fitting for both villains, but it's not super mechanically engaging. You dodge, web up each villain, and attack. I guess my main disappointment is how underutilized I think these villains are, especially the Vulture. After Spider-Man takes them down, it's the last we see of them. I'm a biased Spider-Man fan, but Electro and Vulture are really cool villains, and a lot of awesome stories could have been told with them. In Otto's lab, we see hints at potential subplots involving them. Electro's desire to become pure energy and the Vulture's sickness are interesting stories that are never explored. I think this points to the somewhat strange pacing in Marvel's Spider-Man, as far as the use of supervillains goes. In the first two-thirds of the game, we get very few supervillains. There's the Shocker and Mr. Negative, and not much more than that. In the last act of the game, we get the entire Sinister Six. It lends to this third act feeling high tension and action-packed, but it results in none of the ancillary members of the Sinister Six being allowed to breathe. I wish that some of these villains would have gotten more screen time in the first two acts of the game. I think there is room for it. After the battle, Peter collapses from exhaustion. We see the toll this constant fight is taking on him. Next, Spider-Man chases down Scorpion in Central Park. The villain gets the better of him and pokes Spider-Man with his tail. He's injected with the Scorpion's toxin. Although Scorpion has him dead to rights, he leaves him alive. He says Doc Ock wants to torture him. At first glance, this feels a bit out of character for Otto, at least how he's been portrayed in the game. We haven't seen any sadistic tendencies aside from those pointed at Norman Osborn. He also spared Spider-Man's life with a warning. What reason would he have to now torture Spider-Man? My theory, and I think it holds up pretty well, is that Otto isn't actually looking to torture Spider-Man. I think that's just what he told Scorpion. As we saw by his lab, he knows how to motivate people to do his bidding, and that explanation made sense to Scorpion. However, I believe Otto knows Spider-Man is Peter at this point. He tossed Spider-Man off the bridge with a warning after all. Scorpion's toxin fills Spider-Man with fear. I think Otto's trying to scare Peter off from pursuing the Sinister Six further. In either case, Peter races across the city, heading to the lab to find a cure. He engages with a nightmare version of New York and faces Otto's taunts. Nightmare sections have become a bit of a staple in superhero games, but I think it's great characterization for Peter here. It gives a way to vocalize his insecurities and fears, some of which he wouldn't voice out loud otherwise. You're a failure at life, love, career. You bring nothing but pain. No, stop. I'm not giving up on you. After Peter neutralizes the toxin, he heads back out into the city and calls MJ. He asks when it's okay to give up on a friend. His nightmare has affected him and brought up his greatest fears about Otto. 
If you can't save him, what exactly is he supposed to do? Peter visits May, who's been working herself to the bone helping people despite her sickness. He throws her own words back at her, telling her that she's human too. This moment is a great reinforcement of May's character and reminds us of where Peter got a lot of his qualities. Meanwhile, Miles is hunting for antibiotics, and he comes across escaped convicts scavenging for stuff themselves. Nonetheless, he pushes on. This is a good moment that showcases Miles' own heroism, despite the danger and the lack of superpowers he forges ahead. Unfortunately for him, the convicts aren't the only threat. The rhino is here as well. Miles has to sneak past the bulky titan. This is another civilian section that works well. It plays out like a horror game, as the rhino is genuinely terrifying. It's great contrast and shows just how imposing these villains can be to a normal person, and it underscores how much of a threat they present to the city if left unchecked. Miles manages to get the medicine and escapes. He comes across some convicts who harass him. He uses what Spider-Man taught him and he fights back. It's a good full circle moment for Miles and signifies the end of his arc in the game, at least his civilian arc. Things will change for him very, very soon. Spider-Man heads to the shipyard and he faces off against both Scorpion and Rhino. This boss fight works better for me for a couple reasons. First, I think there's a better build up to this fight, and there's a good establishment of Rhino and Scorpion beforehand. It's more mechanically interesting as well. Rhino constantly advances on you while the Scorpion alternates between attacking from a distance and rushing. When they both attack at an inopportune moment, it can be genuinely tricky to dodge their attacks. But one of the best parts of this fight is the bickering between Rhino and Scorpion. They get in each other's way, and they insult each other even more than Spider-Man. It adds a lot of character to both villains, and overall makes the fight more engaging throughout. In fact, the fight ends with Rhino losing his temper and charging Scorpion. Four of the Sinister Six are down. Only two remain, Martin Lee and Otto. MJ is searching for the location of the Devil's Breath Lab, where they hope there's an anti-serum. Norman Osborn's penthouse is the best place to start looking, so MJ sneaks inside. There's some great environmental storytelling in Osborne's penthouse. While MJ is searching for clues, she comes across memorabilia that makes her reminisce about the good days with Peter and Harry growing up. It adds to her character, Peter and Harry's all at once. Slowly, it's revealed why Harry's mom died. She has a genetic illness. Then it becomes apparent why Harry left for Europe. He has inherited the disease and he's undergoing treatment now. Suddenly, Norman Osborne and his obsession with Devil's Breath makes sense. Why would he risk such calamitous damage to both his company and the greater world? For his family. For his son. She finally finds her way into a secret lab within the penthouse, and she determines the location of Devil's Breath. That's not all she learns, however. We see Martin Lee in an experiment, being overseen by Norman. Lee's parents are by his side, growing increasingly frantic as things go wrong. Otto's there too, and he's shocked at what's going on. There is an explosion. Lee's parents are dead and the lab is in ruins. And Lee now has his powers. Everything makes sense now. Lee's hatred, Otto's ethical concern that caused him to leave Oscorp and break off with Norman. Sable enters the penthouse and MJ hides. In the process, she breaks glass, and a lab spider crawls out. We'll see this little guy later. She calls Spider-Man for backup, and he's on his way, but Sable corners her on the balcony. MJ jumps off, trusting that Spider-Man will catch her. And he does. This is a good moment. I think her trust in Peter encapsulates the rebuilding of the relationship. Spider-Man heads to the lab to get the anti-serum. He's not alone though. Both Martin Lee and Osborne also went to the lab, and Osborne was captured. Spider-Man clears the grounds of Sable's troops, before Sable brawls with him 1v1. He convinces her that they need to work together. Lee has her client, and he'll kill him if Spider-Man and Sable don't do something. She reluctantly agrees. Spider-Man makes his way into the lab. Within, we see Lee's powers affecting everything. It's a good visual representation of his hatred spiraling out of control. Lee wants Spider-Man to turn back and uses his negative powers on him once more. Spider-Man enters another dark realm, where we learn that Lee hopes to honor his parents by bringing Norman to justice, at least his version of justice. Lee gets his hands on the anti-serum and puts Norman to the sword. Spider-Man shows up and intervenes. He and Lee engage in a final battle. Lee's negative powers are even stronger here, and he's able to conjure giant demons. The intensity in this fight is palpable. Lee has the anti-serum we need, not only to save the city, but to save Aunt May, a character we've grown attached to. It shows how story context can make a battle even more potent. Spider-Man beats Lee, and he takes the serum. Things take a turn for the worst, however. Otto shows up, 
He beats down the exhausted Peter and takes the antiserum for himself. He takes Norman Osborn too. Spider-Man is left a shell on the ground. Sable and her men take him to feast for help. Dr. Michaels, the same doctor who carried Devil's Breath, does everything he can to save Spider-Man. Sable even seems concerned for his well-being. You can thank me by not dying. Peter pulls through. Even though he can barely walk, he immediately gets up and asks about May. I love this because it demonstrates both his perseverance and his selfless care for others. May isn't in good shape, and she could die at any moment. Peter turns away knowing what he has to do. There's another great moment with Peter and MJ here. She doesn't try to stop him. She knows better than that. Instead, she gives him advice. Spider-Man may not be able to beat Otto, but Peter's brain can. This is peak MJ. She's loving and knowing of Peter. She's clever and insightful, being able to see Peter's blind spots. As I said, the latter game MJ really wins me over. Meanwhile, Miles gets bit by the laboratory spider. I think we all know what that means. Peter heads to the lab to figure out a way to beat Otto. On the way, Sable calls and lets him know that she's leaving town. He's inspired her and she wants to reflect on the life she lives. Recent events give me pause. Your rescue of Osborne, despite his hatred, it affected me. I must return home. Reflect on this life I choose. Hey, I think I'm actually gonna miss you and your death troopers. This doesn't just come out of the blue. We saw her change when she was helping an injured Spider-Man. In the lab, Peter constructs a new suit. It has a cool black and yellow color scheme matching Otto's arms. Peter has to Oscorp Tower, where Otto is dangling Norman over the side of a building. The truth. The truth. Okay. The truth is, you were only ever worth a damn when you worked for me. The truth is, you could never accept that I'm better than you. You're a failure, Otto, and you always will be. This moment gives us even more insight into Norman's personality. Norman is scared of dying, but there are things more important to him than his own life, namely his pride. Peter saves Norman, then dumps him on another building. It feels sort of like throwing out the trash, which reflects Peter's disdain for Norman after everything he's discovered. Peter heads to the roof, and he and Otto engage in a climactic showdown. The new suit unlocks an ability called Resupply. When activated, it replenishes your gadgets. During the fight with Otto, using your gadgets is a necessity. His arms have to be immobilized to open up Otto for attack. It's cool how the mechanic of the suit ties in perfectly with the narrative. The suit really does help us beat Otto gameplay-wise. Otto fractures Peter's mask. Before Spider-Man even turns around, Otto calls him Parker, which reveals that he's known for a while. As I talked about earlier, I think a lot of Otto's actions make sense in light of him knowing Peter is Spider-Man. This wounds Peter deeply, and we hear it in the rawness of his voice. You knew? This former friend knowingly beat him within an inch of his life. Otto and Peter brawl on the side of the building. No more gadgets, just one-on-one. -on -one. Both men exhausted, worn down, but refusing to give in. Peter and Otto talk personally now. Both are hurt and feel like the others betrayed them. The building and shattering of their relationship throughout the game pays dividends here. The pain in these moments is palpable. Peter goes as far as impaling himself with one of Otto's arms to get him close enough to take down. When Otto's down, we see glimmers of his old personality. There's hope that maybe, just maybe, old Otto's back. But then, Otto tries to blackmail Peter now that he knows his identity. And of course, you rest easy, knowing your secret is safe with me. That glimmer of light is painfully cast into shadow. This is the moment where it's apparent to Peter that his old friend is never coming back. He leaves Otto, turning his back on him. Otto wails pathetically. Where are you going? Peter! Peter! At the end of the day, he's just a sad and monstrous man. Peter returns to feast with the anti-serum in hand. He's prepared to save Aunt May. Dr. Michaels, however, gives him devastating news. They need the entire vial of anti-serum to mass-produce more doses. If he uses the vial on Aunt May, then the rest of the city won't get the anti-serum. He sits with Aunt May, and she tells him to take off the mask, revealing that she's known about his identity for a long time. Take off your mask. I want to see my nephew. Peter doesn't know what to do. He's watching his aunt die with the cure literally in his hand. Aunt May, though, tells him he knows exactly what to do. 
Peter holds the anti-serum near the IV drip, about to give her the cure. Then he pulls back and sets on the vial. He sits with Aunt May, tears streaming down her eyes as she passes away. This is one of the video game endings that has affected me the most. I think its execution first off is perfect. Even without any background knowledge of Spider-Man, the pain of Peter's sacrifice here is easy to resonate with. However, it had a special effect on me. To explain that, I need to give a bit of context. In 2007, there is a story called One More Day. It's one of the most infamous Spider-Man stories. It sees Peter and MJ sacrificing their marriage to save Aunt May's life. Peter was unable to cope with her death and went to the most extreme of lengths to stop it. This story essentially reverted Peter back to being a single bachelor and was a retcon of sorts. Ever since that story in the comics, something just hadn't felt right with Spider-Man. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't all doom and gloom. In fact, some of my all-time favorite stories are from this post One More Day era. But still in the meta, larger scope lens of Spider-Man stories, it felt like he had been frozen in stasis. Spider-Man had always been a character with consistent growth. In the 60s, he started in high school. Then he went to college in the decades that followed, and he got married. But after one more day, that sense of forward progress seemed to stop. All that to say, this insomniac ending feels like a direct refutation of one more day. Peter here is faced with the same choice. Save Aunt May's life by sacrificing something greater. Here in Insomniac's story, Peter says no. Despite the pain and the hardship, he accepts the reality of death, despite how horrible it is, and does the right thing. Through that, he ushers in change. So this ending felt like the redemption, the turning back of one more day, that a lot of us Spider-Man fans had been waiting for for years. That's why the ending has such a personal connection to me. And it's why I think it's so great, past just the execution. It feels like Insomniac envisioned the same Spider-Man that so many of its fans did. The ending just encapsulates why the main story of Marvel's Spider-Man has such a profound effect on me. Despite the flaws I went over, it was so true to the core of the character in such a heartfelt and sincere way that it gave me a true excitement for Spider-Man that I hadn't felt in years. There are a few closing scenes that follow. There's May's funeral, followed up by a scene of Otto getting thrown into the slammer, looking none too happy. MJ and Peter officially reconcile and become a couple once more. Miles reveals his newfound spider powers to Peter. Miles is surprised to learn that Peter is very familiar with what he's going through. The game ends with Norman visiting Harry. Even though Devil's Breath didn't work out, he is no less determined to save his son. And that officially wraps up the narrative. But there is more to Marvel's Spider-Man than just the main story. Let's take a look at the side content and other adventures that the game offers. As an open world game, Marvel's Spider-Man naturally has a lot of different side activities. A lot of them are pretty straightforward collectibles or beating enemy bases, so I'm not going to cover everything. Just the stuff I feel like I have something interesting to talk about. If I covered the side content exhaustively, this video would drag. The premier side content is the side missions. These are additional story content with their own arcs separate from the main story, having beginnings, middles, and ends. For the most part, these side missions are one-off tales involving everyday citizens in New York. They're strangers who Spider-Man helps. These stories are mildly interesting, but they're nothing special. They flesh out New York as a setting, but they don't do much further than that. There are two exceptions. First involves the Tombstone, who MJ briefly brushed up against while investigating the demons. Spider-Man catches wind of a drug Tombstone has manufactured, which replicates his invulnerability. He hopes to sell it to criminals. Spider-Man tracks him down, and the side mission chain culminates in a boss fight against Tombstone. This is the best set of side missions in the games. It picks up on a thread the main story left hanging, and has Spider-Man fight a supervillain. It feels far more connected to the rest of the game, and it feels like content worth experiencing. The other sequence of missions deals with the fallout from Mr. Negative's attack at ESU during the Halloween party. Spider-Man tracks down missing students who are still under the effect of Martin Lee's powers. It's not quite as engaging on a story or gameplay front, but it is another example of picking up from the main story and fleshing out a villain. Unfortunately, these two quest lines are the exception to this game's mission design. In short, I wish more of the side quests were designed like these two, and less like one-off inconsequential jobs. The Taskmaster challenges are a great piece of side content. Taskmaster is a villain who has a photographic memory, and can mimic the fighting of anyone he studies. So he sets up challenges that Spider-Man has to complete while the Taskmaster observes him in action. 
It's a case where the gameplay and narrative explanation coincide perfectly with each other. Taskmaster is mysterious in all business. He'll attack you at intervals once you complete enough challenges. After you complete them all, the Taskmaster ambushes you once more. He uses Spidey's moves against him, and it's a cool fight. Even though the story isn't going to win any awards here, it's an overall memorable encounter. This synergy between narrative and gameplay unfortunately doesn't apply to all the side content. The worst offender in my eyes are the Oscorp research stations around the city. Harry Osborne installed these research stations before his trip to Europe. In his absence, Peter watches over them. The thing is though, every single one of these labs is on the brink of some calamity or another when Peter visits them. They have different stories and different tasks, but it all just feels so contrived. Norman Osborn wants to decommission these stations, and it's not hard to see why. It's one of the few things in the game which felt immersion-breaking and took me out of the story. Overall, I'd say the side content does a good job of supplying more activities, if the main story wasn't quite enough for you. They all fit Spider-Man's character well enough. However, I wouldn't call any of it truly great. The side content doesn't have any worthwhile stories, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like the side content is really trying to tell any worthwhile stories. It meets the bar, but that bar wasn't aimed all that high to begin with. The side content is one area that I think there's a lot of room to improve. Marvel's Spider-Man received three post-launch DLCs that are part of one continuous story called The City That Never Sleeps. They're each pretty quick to play through, about an hour or two long for the main story, and they're all linked together. They focus largely on the Magia crime family, and the increasing chaos as the city falls into a gang war. In short, the DLCs are good, but they're not great. If you like Spider-Man and want more story content and gameplay, you'll probably be pretty happy with them. However, if you decided to skip the DLCs, I don't think you'd be missing very much. So fairly similar to the side content in that sense. However, I think the overall quality of the DLCs is higher. So I'm not going to go into them quite as much details with the main game. Still, there are some things I want to talk about with each DLC, as there is some character development that serves as a build-up for the sequel. The first DLC is called The Heist. The Magia crime family is making moves in the city, seeing an opportunity in the void that the Kingpin and Demon's fall has created. Spider-Man catches wind of an impending art heist. Hammerhead's goons are going to steal a painting called the Maria. Spider-Man arrives on the scene and he stopped the Magia from taking the painting as well as other valuables. There's an interesting gameplay segment where Spider-Man has to jump between Magia goons as they try to escape with stolen goods. They aren't alone, however. Black Cat, thief and former Spider-Man Flame, shows up on the scene. She's also after the painting, well not the painting itself. Inside resides a flash drive, the real object of desire. She takes advantage of the chaos to escape. Spider-Man's confused at why the Black Hat's working with the Hammerhead, a ruthless thug. Spider-Man tracks her down and he learns the answer. The Black Cat drops a bombshell. She has a son who Hammerhead threatens to kill if she doesn't do what he wants. This sends Peter reeling. This could be his son for all he knows. This is a subplot that continues throughout the DLC. Peter wonders if he's the dad while Felicia is evasive about the father. I don't like this subplot. It feels very soap opera and I don't think it's fitting for the character. Spider-Man's all about responsibility. Him wondering if he pulled a Nick Cannon and his sired children is not the type of thing I tuned into Spider-Man for. It's one of Insomniac's rare misses as far as how they treat the character. The one silver lining is that MJ's handling of everything in the DLC is very mature and human. You get small hints of jealousy when Peter's working with the black cat. I mean, that's understandable. If your boyfriend is working with a beautiful leather-clad ex, you're probably going to be a bit defensive. And this whole son thing doesn't help matters. MJ reacts poorly at first, but she comes around to supporting Peter through thick and thin. She feels both genuine and loving, but also very relatable and human. It does a lot to endear me to her further. So in that sense, I think it's handled pretty well. MJ also has the clarity to point out what becomes increasingly obvious. The whole thing is a lie. Black Cat is playing with him. Of course she didn't. Are you sure she's not just playing you? I know her. Peter, however, continues to believe the best in her up until the wool is pulled from his eyes. This follows the pattern we've seen in the first game with Martin Lee and Otto. Peter has trouble seeing the bad in people. This is further seen with one of the DLC's side content missions. He helps a cop on the Black Cat case track down paintings. They belong to the first Black Cat, Felicia's father, who apparently died while escaping prison. It becomes more and more evident that this cop is unusually invested in the case. It's revealed later that he's actually Black Cat's father himself, 
and he played Peter as a fool to get his hands back on the paintings. In that sense, this DLC is good for emphasizing this flaw in Peter's character. Black Hat reveals the truth about her non-existent son, double-crossing Hammerhead and locking Peter in a vault. Peter catches wind that Hammerhead's trying to kill her, but she refuses to listen. It shows his good nature once more. Even though he's been burned, he still does the right thing without hesitation. He arrives too late. Felicia triggers Hammerhead's bomb and she appears to die. There isn't a body though, so you can guess that this isn't the end for her. The DLC ends on this cliffhanger as Hammerhead walks away triumphantly. There's one more scene where Peter and MJ meet about the ordeal. MJ is supportive, saying that he will be a great father one day. Again, I think MJ's character is one of the better parts of this DLC. The second DLC pack is called Turf Wars. As the name suggests, its focus is on the brewing civil war between the crime families and Hammerhead, who is trying to usurp their power. The war has gone hot. Hammerhead's goal with working with Black Cat was to use blackmail, but when that fell through, violence remained as the only option. When the DLC opens, Yuri and Spider-Man see an opportunity. Hammerhead is pinned in a building by the other crime families. This is a golden chance to capture Hammerhead now and end the war early. Spider-Man takes point with Yuri's men on the operation. We haven't seen Spider-Man work this closely with the police before, and it's a sign of the increased trust between Yuri and the wall crawler. The cops for their part are excited to work with him. One of the cops shows off his Spider-Man watch, which is a gift from his kid. The assault begins. Once they get into the building, things go south. Hammerhead gets the better of Yuri's men and they're slaughtered. One of her men remains and she desperately tries to save him. She doesn't. She breaks down, staring at a cracked, broken Spider-Man watch. The watch is a simple narrative trick, forming a bond between us and the cop, but it works well. This scene tugged at my heartstrings and I felt sorry for the cop and Yuri by extension. Throughout this DLC, we watch Yuri lose her faith in everything she once held dear namely the power of the law to punish criminals adequately. She loses faith in Spider-Man 2 when he fails to stop Hammerhead in a timely manner. What? Are you serious? The Sable tech he's been stealing? She had more in her arsenal than I thought. You told me you would take care of this. You told me not to worry. I did, yes, and I screwed up. I'm sorry. Her downfall feels very natural. Although she has dealt with tragedy and hardship in the city before, Hammerhead is different. He directly attacks police precincts. Her friends on the force are the ones dying around her, and her inability to strike back at him eats away at her. She finally snaps, and goes after Hammerhead on her own. She attacks a bar with no name, leaving violence and bloodshed in her wake. Hammerhead is entirely willing to double down and escalate, until things come to a head. He feeds the Magia crime family leaders into a cement mixer, and Spider-Man has to save them. Hammerhead aims at becoming the future of the family, and he's using Sable's tech to do it. Hammerhead has adorned himself in Sable gear, becoming as much machine as man. Once Spider-Man takes him down, Yuri arrives at the scene. She is determined to make Hammerhead pay. She pulls the trigger, but Spider-Man webs the gun, averting the blast. Still, Hammerhead appears dead. There is powerful imagery in these shots. Yuri stands alone. Spider-Man stands in front of the other officers, where she would normally be. She has crossed the line, and Spider-Man and her fellow officers watch from the other side. Hammerhead is thought dead, but he's revived in an ambulance. The threat he presents isn't over. That concludes Turf Wars. This DLC is considerably more dark and dreary than the content we have seen in the game up until this point. This is punctuated by the dreary weather. During this DLC, the sky is overcast up until the last handful of missions. I think it may be my favorite of the DLCs. I feel like the storytelling was the most consistent, and it was action-packed from beginning to end. There were some lows, the main one being Screwball, who was also in the last DLC. She is a supervillain who is a streamer, and she's even more annoying than that premise sounds. There's always time for great content, especially when it stars New York's favorite spider guy in a series of high-stakes life-or-death challenges. Come on, you know you want to join the fun. Don't keep my audience waiting. She is deliberately annoying, but there comes a point where a character can be so aggravating it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or not. Whenever Screwball shows up, I just want her gone. She's in the last DLC too for what it's worth, but I'm done talking about her. Peter and Miles also frequently chat during these DLCs. Miles is starting to get a handle on his powers. I like how Peter doesn't want him to go out and be a vigilante, even though that's what he did at Miles' age. It feels very responsible. All that remains is the final DLC, Silver Lining. This DLC sees the return of Silver Sable. She's caught wind of Hammerhead's use of her technology and she takes that personally. She's come to stop him. 
Right away, things feel a little off with this DLC. Silver Sable comes out swinging at Spider-Man, blaming him for the proliferation of her tech and saying she doesn't trust him. It feels like a regression of her character. At the end of the base game, she was hoping Spider-Man wouldn't die and was so inspired by him that she left the city to do some soul searching. Her coming down on him so hard and fast is a bit of a head scratcher. I get that she's mad, but it doesn't make sense that she's taking it out on Spider-Man. He even says a line that indicates this. <sighs> what happened that you can thank me by not dying? Sable hunts down Hammerhead with reckless abandon, brushing aside Spider-Man's attempts to work together. This results in her plane getting trapped on a rooftop by Hammerhead's goons. Spider-Man bails her out before the big man himself appears. Clearly he's gotten a few touch-ups. He gets the better of Spider-Man and Sable and they appear to be doomed. Then, the black cat shows up and rescues the wall crawler. As expected, it turns out she didn't die in the explosion after all. Sable though isn't so lucky. She gets kidnapped by Hammerhead. The black cat gives Spider-Man the flash drive she stole, which provides Spider-Man all the info he needs to take down Hammerhead before she vanishes into the sunset. Spider-Man tracks down Sable, who's being interrogated by Hammerhead's goons. Spider-Man frees her, and Sable at last decides to work with him for real. They determine that Hammerhead's head ironically is his weak point. If they superheat his skull, it will grow weak enough for Spider-Man to knock him unconscious. They prepare on Sable's ship, and Hammerhead attacks. Spider-Man and Sable work together to take down the goon. Once Hammerhead has been eliminated, Sable declares that she's heading back to her home country which has been embroiled in civil war. Spider-Man is refused a hug and she flies off. The DLC ends on a bit of an abrupt note. Aside from Sable's somewhat odd characterization at the beginning, she and Spidey work well as a duo. Her stoic, angry nature plays well off his lighter, more positive attitude. They have some good moments together, and I smiled when she finally relented and gave him a high five. The DLC is short, but it's well paced. Hammerhead isn't quite as interesting here as he was in the prior DLCs. As he's completed his transformation and is essentially just a malevolent cyborg now, but he gets the job done. Funnily enough, the best storytelling in this DLC are the audio logs you find at crime scenes scattered throughout the city. You listen to logs of a therapist with a patient who turns out to be a mob hitman. There are twists and turns throughout, with the therapist then secretly recording the therapy sessions with Yuri Watanabe for the hitman. The therapist ends up being a double agent working with the police. Yuri is hoping to catch the hitman, but before she can, the therapist is killed. It's really riveting storytelling, and I found myself hunting around for the next audio tape to hear the next chapter in the story unfold. It all ends with Spider-Man coming across the dead mobster, with Yuri having killed him. She has lost faith in the law entirely. Her downfall is complete. This storytelling is so well done, and it feels like the narrative resolution from the last DLC. It makes me think this subplot should have been the main focus of the DLC, rather than what we got with Sable. So we've gone over each of the DLCs. I think Turf Wars is the best, followed by Silver Lining and then The Heist. Overall, they're all of a pretty similar quality though. They do a good job tying up some narrative elements from the main game while building characters for Spider-Man 2. But as I mentioned at the beginning overall, I wouldn't call them can't miss content. When I finished the main campaign of Spider-Man, if I wasn't making this video, I would have probably chosen to roll a New Game Plus playthrough rather than play through all the DLCs again. And I think that sums up my thoughts in shorter terms. I've spent a lot of my time in this video going over my criticisms of Marvel's Spider-Man. And it's true that I don't believe the game is perfect. However, I think that the nature retrospective videos makes the negative parts of the game stick out more, because you generally have more to say about those aspects of a title. So in my conclusion, I want to bring it full circle by reiterating just how fantastic this game is. Marvel's Spider-Man does so many things right, that when I'm playing through the main story or web swinging through the city, pretty much all the negatives just fade into the background. This game means so much to me because at the end of the day, I felt like Insomniac truly understood the character of Peter Parker from top to bottom, from his time soaring above the city behind a mask and the times on the earth with empty pockets. Spider-Man's a character that means more to me than I can say. So the fact that this game restored such a pure, unadulterated joy in the character that I hadn't felt for a long time automatically gives this game such a special place in my heart. This game restored my hope in my hero and the stories that could be told with him in the days and years to come. And as Spider-Man 2 approaches, I hope to have that same jubilation once more. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for more Spider-Man analysis, check out my Ultimate Spider-Man video. 
I put a lot of time into making it and I think it's something you would enjoy. One last time, thanks to all of you. Until next time.